Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about impedance matching. Now in a previous video I looked at how this can be achieved using resistive networks and although that works, in general you can match any impedance that way, either going to lower or to higher impedances. The main issue with resistive matching is that it's a lossy type of matching. The larger the impedance mismatches, the more signal loss you will end up getting on the matching circuit. So today I want to look at how impedance matching can be made with a lossless circuit using reactive elements, inductors and capacitors. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Now to start things off, lossless impedance matching can be done with either single stage or multi-stage circuits and we'll look at both today. But before anything else, it's important to observe that since we're trying to match specific constant impedances, we need specific value matching elements. And if we use the capacitor or inductor type reactive elements, their reactance is not a constant, it's frequency dependent. So the first thing to keep in mind with this type of impedance matching circuit, unlike the resistive type which is frequency independent, is that LC impedance matching networks have a specific operating frequency and bandwidth. It's not a one circuit fits all frequencies type of solution, but rather you need to adapt your circuit to your specific frequency of interest. So to build a basic circuit, you need a series and a parallel element, and it doesn't really matter which of the connected impedances are the input and the output, what matters is that the parallel element sits on the side with the highest connected impedance. Now these two components will be a pair formed from a capacitor and an inductor, and it doesn't really matter which of the elements is which, it's just that you need both type of elements to get a positive and a negative reactance that cancel out. Now the formulas to calculate these two elements are not that complicated, but they're not that easy to apply either. So my recommendation is to take advantage of modern technology and use a spreadsheet program and let the computer do all of the number crunching. So I have the formulas here, separated on the two types, so when the inductor is parallel or the inductor is in series, and we can now easily play around with the input values. So we have our frequency of interest, the input and the output impedance, doesn't matter which is the highest or the lowest because we can implement this into the formulas to simply extract the highest and the lowest value. So you don't have to bother with that. And as an example, I set a test frequency of 1 MHz and one of the impedances is 480 ohms, the other is 50. So what we can work out is what the total Q factor of the network will be, 1.46, and what the values of the inductor and capacitors will be. And one of the things that you may notice is that depending on which element is which, so which is in series and which is in parallel, you will get slightly different values. So you don't have exactly the same inductor value when it's in parallel to when it's in series. And the same thing is of course valid for the capacitor. So now before moving forward, let's first make sure that these calculations are correct. So let's check them using a circuit simulator, LT Spice of course. Now we can check that the impedances are matched correctly using a sine wave signal through a transient simulation by looking at two specific things. So first of all, if the impedance of the signal source is matched to the load, then the voltage present on the output of the signal source will be half that to when the signal source is going into an open load. So since I'm using a 1 volt amplitude signal, we should get half a volt. So if we quickly check our circuit and we look on the output voltage, we get half a volt, so that's good. And the second thing that we can check is how much power actually gets delivered into the load. And the maximum power that can get delivered is the power that would be delivered into a matching impedance. So here I have my signal source with an internal impedance of 480 ohms, driving a 480 ohm load, and we see that the power delivered is about 500 and something microwatts. And when we check our 50 ohm load after the matching network, we get the exact same amount of power delivery. So both our conditions are met. Now, just as an example, I prepared this other circuit, which has the same impedance matching elements. It has the same 50 ohms on the output, 480 on the input, but it's running at a different frequency. So 823 kilohertz. And if we look at the voltage, we still have 500 millivolts, so half of the input voltage. 
But if we check the power delivery, we have only about 360 microwatts. So you can have one condition, but not the other. And in a similar fashion, we can swap around the input and the output of the circuit. So now the signal source has 50 ohms and the load 480. We can check the voltage level, 500 millivolts on the output of the signal source. And we can check the power delivery. So into an ideal 50 ohm load, we would have 5 milliwatts. And after the matching circuit into 480 ohms, we get the same 5 milliwatts. So the calculations are okay. Next, we can verify the bandwidth of the circuit using an AC simulation. And at the same time, see how the circuit responds to different frequencies. So I have the same circuit as before. Let's just run it. Now, if we look at the signal amplitude at the input, so after the signal source, we can see that we go through the halfway point, so minus six decibels at two frequencies. So at our frequency of interest, one megahertz, but at the other frequency also, 823. So this is where I got the frequency that we just simulated. But now if we look at the signal level on the load, so at the output, we can see that it has a single peak value at our frequency of interest, so at one megahertz. At any other frequency than this, there's a lower signal level reaching the load, so the highest power is delivered at this specific frequency. Now, another thing that we can look at is what's the difference between using the two different arrangements. So either having parallel inductors or parallel capacitors. So in our first case, we have the parallel inductor. And in the second case, so in green, we have the parallel capacitor. And what we can see, if we just zoom in a bit, at our frequency of interest, they both behave in exactly the same way. So both of the circuits are being matched and the same amount of power is getting delivered to the load. But when we zoom out, we can clearly see that our left side circuit, so the blue trace, has a high pass filter behavior. It only lets higher frequencies pass. Whereas the parallel capacitor circuit, tracing green, has a low pass behavior. So the choice of components should be done based on which type of filter you would most likely need. Do you want a high pass or do you want a low pass? Now, when designing the basic two element matching circuit, one of the things that we cannot influence is the bandwidth of the circuit. Since this will be directly impacted by the Q factor of the circuit, which is linked to the connected impedances. And those are fixed. So there's not much we can do about that. So the way around this is to create a multi-stage design. So to connect our real physical impedances to an intermediate or virtual value. Now we can do this either through two stages or through more, depending on our needs. And based on how we choose this intermediate impedance value, we can determine whether the global Q factor will be larger or smaller than the one for the basic circuit. So if our intermediate value is larger than our largest impedance, or it's smaller than the smallest impedance, then the global Q factor will be larger than the one of the base circuit. So our bandwidth will be smaller. And the other way around, if our intermediate value is in between the two connected impedances, then our global Q factor will be smaller, so our bandwidth will be wider. Now, the exact same calculations are valid for this approach. It's just that we need multiple pairs of components based on the multiple stages. So I prepared here the calculations for the two approaches. On the one side, we can go from 480 ohms to 50, through an intermediate value of 20 ohms, which is smaller than both. And we get, of course, all of the component values, the various pairs. And we can do the exact same thing by going through an intermediate value, which is in between our impedances of interest. So through 200 ohms in this case. And again, we get a set of component values. So now to see that these calculations are correct, let's turn to the circuit simulator again to check them out. So to test this out, First of all, I created an impedance matching circuit with two stages, which goes through an intermediate impedance value. So we go from 480 ohms to 200 and then to 50. So these are the component values based on our previously done calculations. And if we run the simulation, and first of all, we compare to our reference circuit, so the single stage impedance matching network, and we look at what we get on the more complex circuit, and we just zoom in a bit to make things a bit more clear. So first of all, what we can see is that at one megahertz, both circuits 
react the same way, the same amount of energy gets transmitted to the load. But what we can also see with our second circuit, so the blue trace, we have a much wider transmission frequency range. So our signal is almost unattenuated for a few megahertz and then it drops off. So we have clearly increased the bandwidth of our filter. Now we can go the other way and try to make a more narrow band filter. And for this we can either go through a higher impedance or a lower impedance than our two impedances that are being matched. So on the left side I'm going through a 1000 ohm impedance and on the right side I'm going through a 20 ohm impedance. And the first thing to notice about this sort of matching circuit is that the highest or the lowest impedance now is in the middle of the circuit. So we will have two of our reactive elements either in parallel or in series. So in our first case we have the two inductors in parallel and in the second case we have the two capacitors in series. And there's no point in using two components to achieve this. We can simply use a single equivalent component, so a single inductor or a single capacitor. And basically what we end up with is either a T filter or a Pi filter. So now if we look at how these circuits react, again we will compare to our initial circuit, so the one with the single stage, we can look at the circuit going through a thousand ohm impedance. And if we zoom in again to get a clearer picture, we can see at one megahertz we have the exact same response, but other than that the bandwidth has narrowed a bit. So we have a narrower passband for our filter. And for the other case, so the Pi filter, we get an almost identical response. So the difference comes from the way in which the impedance ratios are changed. But again we can see that at one megahertz we get the exact same result. And then we have a smaller bandwidth then with our reference circuit. Now the basic filter stage will behave as either a high pass or a low pass depending on how you've chosen your components. But when working with multi-stage filters where you have intermediate impedance values, you can choose the filter stages to be of either the same type or of different types. Now if you set all of the stages to be of the same type, then you'll end up having a filter with a higher order of one type or another, so a higher order high pass filter or a higher order low pass filter, but you can also set your filter stages to be of different kinds and get a band pass filter. So by combining the two types of stages, depending on how your impedance values are chosen, you will end up having a band pass filter effect. Now our previous spreadsheet already gave us all of the component values we need, so we have also the calculation for when the capacitor is in parallel and the inductor is in series, so we can simply use these. And I put them into the simulation. So I kept our previous circuit with the two back-to-back -back capacitors and I just simply swapped out the second stage for the inductor and capacitor in different positions. So if we run the simulation to compare the two, so first off our previous circuit and now the one with the changed inductor and capacitor, we can see that at our frequency of interest, so at 1 MHz, the response is exactly the same, it's just that before and after we have a different result. So we can see that we have frequency attenuation both at higher and at lower frequencies. So we have our clear bandpass effect. Now you may have already noticed that the calculated component values are really strange and specific. It's highly unlikely you'll get these exact components as typical everyday standard values. Now there are all sorts of commercially available dedicated RF components with all sorts of values for the right price of course. But especially if you want to build a single circuit, it's easier to just use variable handmade inductors and variable or trimmer capacitors. So finally, let's test out some of our previously analyzed circuits in real life. And for this, I built a basic board which has both 50 ohm input and output connectors, but on the input side I added a resistive matching network to increase the impedance from which our impedance matching circuit will be fed to 480 ohms. The resistors were calculated based on the corrected equations from last time's video and I also built two variable inductors so we can fine tune both of them to get the desired inductance value and I'm also using a variable capacitor in parallel with a fixed value capacitor again so we can fine tune the value to match the calculations. So to test things out I prepared the setup right here. So what I have is my signal generator which is outputting a signal that goes directly into my circuit and it's also going through this line into my first channel of the oscilloscope. Now the output of my circuit goes also into the oscilloscope onto the second channel. 
And here it also has the 50 ohm termination impedance. So the first channel doesn't have a dedicated termination, it only has the 50 ohms of the circuit. So first thing to test out is our single stage filter. So this is the circuit that I want to try out. And first step of course is to check that our components have the correct value. So first off my capacitance meter, let's just connect one of the terminals and adjust it to zero. There we go. Now if we connect the second terminal, we see that we have about 1060 picofarads, we need 1085. So I'll just adjust the value a bit. So 184, that'll do. Next, I'll need to check the inductor. So my inductance meter has a minus 11 microhenry offset. So we need 26. So I need my device to show 15. So if I connect it and I just adjust the core a bit in the inductor and we have 15 microhenry displayed by the device plus the 11 offset, 26. So now if I assemble everything, we got our input signal going into the side with the resistor matching network, the inductor, the series capacitor, and then the output. So this also gets connected to the oscilloscope. So now everything is connected, signal generator is set to one megahertz, outputting one volt peak to peak when it's going into a 50 ohm load. So the internal signal source has two volts, but when you have a matching impedance, you'll only see one volt. And if we look on the oscilloscope, we do see a peak to peak value of 1.04. So the circuit that we've connected the signal generator to has the 50 ohms. Now if we look at our output signal, so the one coming through our matching circuit, we can see that the RMS value is about 56 millivolts. And if we compare this to what our simulation is telling us, we are getting almost identical values. Also, if we adjust the scale a bit, we see that also the phase shift on our measurement and on our simulation seems to be the same. But this is not definitive proof. So what we need to do to see that our circuit is actually working correctly is to perform an AC measurement. So to trace the Bode plot of the response of this circuit. So fortunately this oscilloscope and signal generator pair can do that. I will be plotting the phase and amplitude traces of the circuit from 100 kilohertz up to 10 megahertz. And I'm comparing the output signal and the signal going into the circuit. So it's not really the original signal coming from the signal generator, it's what comes out of the signal generator and before the resistive impedance matching. So anyway, if we run this, we can see the signal generator automatically sweeping the frequency and the device is plotting it out and it's done. We can see that our amplitude and phase curves are almost identical to what we've gotten with the simulator. We have our peak response at exactly one megahertz, which is the line in the middle. And just to check, we can go through the list of individual scan frequencies and see that we've gotten the smallest amount of attenuation at about 1 MHz, 1 1.08. So the circuit is working correctly. Next, let's test out one of the two-stage filters. So I already prepared here the Pi filter built with two inductors and a single capacitor. And I already set the component values to match the ones in the calculations. So with our time domain simulation, we can see our two signals and compared to last time, we can see that the RMS value on the output is slightly lower, so only 53 millivolts. But anyway, let's now move to the frequency domain measurement. So to see the Bode plot of this circuit. So again, we can see our peak response at one megahertz. So the circuit is correctly fine tuned and we can also see our more substantial slope on the lower frequency side. So this measurement is starting at around minus 75, 76 decibels, whereas our previous measurement started at about minus 58. So we have a higher order filter action. Also, we can almost make out that our bandwidth is slightly smaller. So the scale is a bit different, but it's okay. Finally, the phase shift again matches our simulation. It's just that it's not centered correctly on the oscilloscope. So when it's going below minus 180, it's starting from plus 180, but it's the same result that we would get with the simulation. So our practical circuit fits our theoretical results. In the end, if you need to match two different impedance paths for signals that have relatively tight bandwidths, you can go with one of the lossless impedance matching circuits discussed today. And even though in real life, reactive components will have some serious resistance resulting in some signal loss, 
this matching method is far superior to the purely resistive circuits, especially when large impedance ratios are being interconnected. So you'll see and use this sort of circuits quite often in RF signal paths. Now, there is one more thing that needs to be said. Today, I looked at purely resistive signal sources and signal loads. But in real life, this is rarely the case. Almost always, there is a reactive part. So the impedances that we are trying to match are almost always complex. And that is a topic for a different time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.